Lisa, we'll just start with telling us about your background. Sure. So I'm a clinical psychologist, and so um, I've practiced for about 25 years, and I both consult to Laurel School and then have a private practice, and I write the adolescence column for the New York Times. So that's a lot, and I, I feel like, you know, your role at Laurel these days has probably gotten even more intense because anxiety has become such an issue. So I've been at Laurel for 15 years, and I've gotten to watch trends as they've emerged. And there's no question that about 10 years ago, both at Laurel and in my practice and in the other consulting work I do, I started to hear girls and families, and also parents of sons as well, talk about anxiety mm -hmm. in a way that I had not heard before. Um, I felt like I didn't have a conversation where either stress or anxiety didn't come up, and often they were at the center of the conversation. I feel myself wanting to sort of solve the problems of the universe when it comes to anxiety. It's something that I've dealt with personally. It's something that so many of us have dealt with. What do you think the reasoning is that we've seen this shift, especially with the younger generation? Sure. Um, I think there's probably several reasons that have all come together. So one significant one is that there's some misunderstanding about anxiety. That we've started to talk about anxiety as though it's always harmful and always problematic, whereas psychologists understand that anxiety is actually a normal and healthy function mm -hmm. that alerts us when something's wrong. So we want a degree of anxiety. And so one thing I say all the time to teenagers is, if you show up at a party and you start to feel really anxious, pay attention to that feeling, mm -hmm. right? You don't want to make that feeling quick. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like, it's telling you something. Um, so it alerts us to outside threats. It also alerts us to inside threats. So if somebody says to me, if a te teenager says to me, you know, I'm really nervous about this upcoming test, I'll usually ask, well, have you studied? And if they say no, I'll say, well, then you're having the right reaction. <laughs> like, yeah. you should be nervous right now. Right. So part of what we can do is to help young people appreciate that there's healthy anxiety which alerts us to things that are really happening versus unhealthy anxiety, which is when we're anxious for no reason at all. You know, you wake up anxious or you feel nervous all the time and there's not really something happening. Okay. So that's one reason. I think then there are others. We are asking more of kids than we ever have before. Um, in many ways, college has come to high school, high school has come to middle school. And so the demands we are placing academically on students and their extracurriculars and the volunteer work and all that we ask of young people is different than in previous generations. And so they're not getting as much sleep. You know, that they are working really hard all day long and then they are up late at night. So in some ways you're kind of creating a recipe for kids to be more fragile. Right, for sure. I mean, I know from my own experiences that if I don't get proper sleep, mm -hmm. my anxiety is catapulted. It goes way up. It and really sleep does. is the glue that holds humans together. And what most people don't know is that elementary school students need 11 hours of sleep, middle school students need 10 hours, and high schoolers actually need nine. So you've written a new book. Mm -hmm. Would mm -hmm. you like to talk sure. about that? So the book that I had come out in mid-February is called Under Pressure, Confronting the Epidemic of Stress and Anxiety in Girls. And I did write it in response to what I was observing both in my practice and as I traveled around to speak. And um, my aim in the book is to help families have a way to react to their daughter's stress and anxiety in a way that will help bring it back down to size as opposed to make things worse. Are families, in your opinion, because you see a lot, mm -hmm. accepting of this or is it still stigmatized? Is it sort of that push it off here, uh, my daughter's fine, or I, is it being recognized? I think we're seeing both underreaction and overreaction. Mm -hmm. And what I want to go for is a thoughtful response. So I think there are families who minimize how much distress their child is in. Because it's real. It's real. Having well, lived through it, I can tell you. It is real. And they say, no, 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 you're just being worried. Don't worry about it. You know, and, and they can sort of slough off the girl's concerns, which makes her feel quite a bit worse and only then amplifies her distress. So there are some families who do that. There are also families who are overreacting in a way that makes things worse. Right. And so the example I always think about for that is how good our intuition was as parents when our toddlers scraped their knee. You know how your toddler falls down and scrapes her knee? Mm -hmm. And even if it's a big mess, our intuition tells us to say, like, it's okay, you're going to be all right. right. Brush you it know, off. Brush it off, don't worry. And that, for kids, is actually a very containing response. They sort of feel like, well, if you're okay, then I'm probably okay. 
Whereas if the parent sees a scraped knee and panics, right, and becomes really, really upset, the kid will invariably become really upset. Social media. All right. So, and depending on, I guess, the age, you know, some kids are in it, some kids not. But at some point, I think they're all going yeah. to be with the yeah. way it's going. Yeah. Uh, do you believe that that plays a role in anxiety? I think it does. We have some data that are very good showing that part of how it creates the problem is through sleep. So what happens, we have data showing that kids who have phones and in their bedrooms, starting by eighth grade, if that disrupts their sleep, we subsequently see kids having higher rates of anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. So that's one key factor that is well established in the literature. Okay. The rest of the data remain correlational, like we're not really sure what's driving the train. Right. But here's what we can kind of be sure of at this point. It is very stressful to be looking at all the time these curated, crafted images yes. of the people in your life. Because what I always say to teenagers is, look, you're comparing the lived-in home of your life to the furniture showroom of their lives that they're putting up, right? And no lived-in home is ever going to look nearly as good as a furniture showroom. Right. So the It's life with a filter. Exactly. <laughs> it's, 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 they took 100 pictures, they chose one, right? And yeah. we have to remind teenagers of this all the time. So one of the things I think we have to do these days is to treat this as the media around which they need media literacy. You know, like for years we've done media literacy where we like show kids magazines and then we help them deconstruct the image. Okay, they're not looking at magazines anymore. No. They're looking at Instagram. Right. And we can do the exact same thing. We can say, you know, okay, tell me about that girl. Is that what she looks like in real life? You know, or who's that picture for? Or what message is she trying to send? Or why is she posed in that particular way? You know, so we can't ask all those questions at once because they'll get annoyed with us. But I think we want to start, like you said, to put that filter in mm -hmm. where they're questioning what they see and not taking it at face value because right. you can never compare right. to what It's like an airbrush images. on a magazine. It's exactly like an airbrush on a magazine. So this is the media. We've always done media literacy. Now we're doing media literacy on media they create for themselves. Then I feel like there's the whole issue of bullying through social media, the computer. It's almost a way for bullies to hide, in my opinion. Yeah. And I guess protecting our children, what are your thoughts on that? So here's what we know about bullying and social media. We do know that what happens in kids' online lives reflects what's happening in their real life. So usually kids who are engaging in bullying, either as a bully or receiving bullying as a victim, they're having the same thing happen in their day to day. So it's not like they have one experience in real life and then a separate experience online. Hmm. The problem is that online means it, means it goes on all night, all weekend. Everybody sees it. It's wildly exposed. And so what the online environment does is it takes something that is already awful and then puts it on steroids. Yeah. And so that's the downside. The upside is it also creates a document of the bullying that bullying used to be something that only happened in locker rooms and it was a hearsay situation. Now, when kids are bullying online, they've created a full document of what they've done. So our job as adults is to say to young people, if someone mistreats you online, do not react. Bring it to an adult. Because sometimes they'll get into it and they'll push back, and then by the time the adult sees it, it's very murky to know what really happened. So we can get out in front of it by letting kids know we're here to help but you can't engage it. Yeah. When should parents be concerned? When should they intervene? Because as a mom, mm -hmm. yeah, my fear would be that, you know, my children were being bullied, were anxious, were, God forbid, mm -hmm. depressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You hear about suicides. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. let's just throw it out there. Sure. I mean, sure. this is a real thing. Um, at what point, you know, do we intervene so that we can finally nip this in the bud? Sure. Just to start with bullying and yeah. then to move to the others. Because I feel like that kind of it sort of tips it. into these others. Right. We really want to make a clear distinction between conflict and bullying. Conflict is kids not getting along. Right. Somebody giving it as good as they get it. Mm -hmm. Or somebody getting it but not minding it or able to withstand it. That comes with being in an environment where there's more than one person, right, which is school. Bullying is where a person is targeted, they are unable to defend themselves, and it is a one-way street. So that's a place where we can start, make sure we're not overreacting, because the overreaction can make it worse. 
and we can help kids manage conflict effectively, and that's an important job for parents to do. But then the question of like, when to really worry? When to really worry? For sure. The definition I always go to is that we worry, I'm gonna give a really technical definition and then I'm gonna okay. sort of spin it out. We worry when there's an interference with progressive development, which is when the child's not growing as they should. So young people should be growing on lots of different fronts. They should be growing intellectually, you know, gaining strength at school, building friendships, you know, so social growth. They should be growing emotionally, you know, better and better able to manage their own feelings. They should be growing in their self-care, you know, they can take better and better care of themselves over time. If they are so anxious that they are refusing to go to school, or so anxious that they are refusing to go out and engage with other kids, then you're seeing an interference with academic development or social development. If they are so depressed that they are not caring for themselves adequately, or they become overwhelmed by emotion and are unable to sort of pull themselves out of it, then you're seeing an interference with normal development. So the thing that's confusing is that normally developing kids are all over the map, right? A normally developing teenager is going to be in a great mood one minute, in a fetal position on your kitchen floor the next right, minute, hormones. and then back to a good mood. Yeah. And so our job as adults is to try to step back and look at a three-day period, a week-long period, right? And right. to really ask the question, over the course of a longer span, not a 24-hour period, a longer span, mm -hmm. is their development being held up by emotion? Okay. How do you feel about medication and our children? Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, is this something that we're seeing more of? Should we be seeing more of it mm -hmm. because there's more depression? We're seeing more distress. Um, so I am a fan of medication, but we have to be careful about how we use it. So the good news is we're really good at treating anxiety and we're really good at treating depression. Mm -hmm. And this is the other reason I wrote my book is that I sort of feel like there's a general sense of helplessness around these well, things. Well, and I think that there's a stigma with that too because I feel like it's almost, I'm embarrassed to say yeah. if yeah. you know, you're in that situation that I'm taking this medication and yeah. I feel like our, our kids need to know it's okay. It is okay. To not be okay. Just like you'd take medication for strep. Absolutely, absolutely. The way I like to think about medication is that it should be part of a treatment plan. That when we look at the data on how to do effective treatment, what we always see is that medication and psychotherapy together mm -hmm. are the most effective. So I'm not a huge fan of medication being given in the absence of also doing psychotherapy. Right. I often like to see people try psychotherapy first to see if that works because it can be really, really effective mm -hmm. and helpful and then medication can come in if needed. The other thing that I think about a lot with kids and medication, which is different than adults and medication, is that one of the things I learned in my training is that all teenagers secretly worry that they're crazy. And when I first heard that, I thought, oh, that can't be true. But I've come to think it is true. The teenagers know that there's a lot going on inside. And so we have to be careful with teenagers about how we present the idea of medication. Because when clinicians are glib about it, and they're like, well, let me try you on an antidepressant or something. Sure. It's really well-meaning, and it may be the exact right thing, a teenager can easily hear confirmation that they're broken. And that's not actually gonna help them feel better. So the way I tend to present this idea to teenagers is I say, look, there's a lot we can do with psychotherapy, and if that's not adequate, there's more support we can bring your way. And you're really feeling terrible, and when people feel terrible, they deserve as much support as we can possibly offer them. So we can look at medication as an option, see if that helps you feel better. You get to decide if this is what really is working well for you, but we're gonna work together to make sure that you feel as good as you can possibly feel. But I'm very cautious about how I present it, and I really work to present it as an additional form of support, not as sort of a tossed off idea, right. because teenagers can take that in a way that lands quite painfully for them. Okay. Finally, uh, you know, and I applaud you for all your work on this, what do you want moms and dads to take away from your book most of all? So from under pressure, what I want moms and dads to know is that anxiety and stress come with the territory of being a person in this culture and certainly being a young woman in this culture. And the way I built the book was that chapter one is about stress and anxiety, the basics, and then chapter two is about girls at home, which are all the transactions that happen between parents and daughters mm -hmm. that can make it better or worse. Chapter three is about girls among girls, the conflict and competition that mm -hmm. girls have to navigate. Mm -hmm. Chapter four is girls among boys, and there's a lot that causes stress for girls in those <coughs> relationships. Chapter five is girls at school, right, which is a big source of strain Change. for girls. 
And then chapter six is about girls in the culture and all that our culture asks of girls and the unfair expectations our culture holds for girls and what families can do at home to help buffer their daughters against that.